Uh, so 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7 down to verse 17. Uh, shall we just pray together um, once again? Lord, we thank you for that which you have spoken in your word. And we ask it even this night that you would be gracious in our midst. Uh, speak yourself, Lord. Show us yourself and lead us on to that higher ground, we ask. We pray for your great help and that the word tonight would be that of God and rather that of man, we pray. Amen. So uh, from verse 7, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, how much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Well, I'd like to speak tonight on that last verse that, um, that I read. But we all, with open face, beholding it as a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And you might have uh, heard as I read through the chapter, uh, those verses, how many times that word glory or glorious appears. And that was in our hymn before the scriptures, wasn't it? And glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. And what a wonderful word that captures something of the reality of being a Christian and the reality of what God has called us to. It says of Christ, doesn't it, that in bringing many sons unto glory, the, the work of Christ has been to bring fallen sinners from death to life and not just a small amount of life, but the glory of God that he has brought us into. And what I'd like to speak about tonight and the reason why I wanted to read from verse seven down to the end is something of the glory and the liberty that there is in the new covenant in Christ and particularly to look at how it compares to the old covenant that is described and revealed in this one incident in Moses's face shining and the veil that was upon his face after he had met with God. I was actually brought here during the week by reading in Exodus chapter 33 and Exodus chapter 34 when Moses goes up the mount to meet with God and it's the incident we've got described here that is is being described and compared to the new covenant where Moses met with God face to face and God spoke to him and gave him the, the commandments once again on two tables of stone. And, and Moses came back down the mountain, having been spending those days with God at the top of the mountain. And he was oblivious to the fact that his face shone. And uh, it's that incident that is here compared. And, and in fact, to show how far the new covenant that we are now in exceeds that experience that Moses had upon the mount those years ago and really it is this that we might enjoy the presence of God now and isn't that just the case that the idea of us being reconciled that is that we might that we might know God now and it, it really is a very simple thought just by so way of introduction but if we were to be reconciled to God but then unable to know him then we might say 
well, am I really reconciled? Has my sin really been dealt with? If that fellowship that Adam and Eve, that they had with God before sin came in, is not restored to us by Christ, then there's something amiss. That, that is what God intends us to do. Do you remember the incident with Absalom? He was a very wicked son of David. <clears throat> but before his chief rebellion, uh, the fruits of this man had become apparent in some things that he had done wrong. But he was banished for a while by his father, David, from coming into his presence and into his kingdom. He was, he was forced to be in exile. But then he was brought back. Uh, but David set a condition that though he could come back to Jerusalem, he would not allow to be and see David's face while he was there. And it's really interesting what Absalom says. He says, wherefore am I come from Geshur? It would have been good for me to have been there still now that now therefore let me see the king's face and the argument that absalom was making was that if i've been brought back from exile but i'm not allowed to see the face of my father the king then i might as well not be here i might have stayed at geshur it would have been worse for me to be in jerusalem but banished from his presence and i i suppose there's something of an analogy there isn't there if we think that I have been forgiven of my sins that I am in Christ. And yet to say, if we couldn't now come and behold the face of God, we'd say, well, have I really been reconciled with God in the way that I imagine I would? And the answer is that by having been forgiven of our sins through Christ, we can now come into the presence of God and draw near, yes, with our eyes in the flesh as we are now, we cannot yet see God. But one day when we're transformed by Christ, we will see him face to face. And the point is that right now, even though we're still in the flesh, spiritually, we have that access now to enjoy the presence of God. And I'd like to just touch on that from this present, from this chapter here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And, and first of all, just to talk about the old covenant. And I'm not going to be exhaustive through this passage. But just to draw out a few things. And verse 7, he first of all says, But if the ministration of death, written in gravings in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away with. As I've mentioned, those who are a bit unfamiliar with this, you can read about this in Exodus chapter 34, amongst a couple of other places. But that's the, the chief place where Moses went up the mount and it was expressly told to Moses in chapter 34 and verse 3 that no man shall come up with thee and in fact he adds a second condition neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount so it's not only that no one else sorry that someone else could come up part of the way with you but there would be no one else on the whole mountain and, and it would signify that there was a still a great gulf between God and man and only one man was allowed to come up the mountain to hear the word of God and that was Moses. It was a terribly restrictive covenant that was there and in fact he has a third condition neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mountain so in other words even keep your animals away from the foot of the mountain and while he was up there as I mentioned God met with Moses and spoke to him and it says wonderfully at the end of chapter 34 in verse 29 that the skin, uh, sorry, Moses wist not, that is, he didn't know, that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And that was that while God talks with Moses, the very skin of Moses' face shone. And that's what the glory that they're talking about here uh, in the old covenant that Moses had that it was literally uh, and Moses didn't know it he wasn't aware of say a, a, a glow or a sensation in his face he he was he was ignorant of it he felt we might say just the same but he came down the mountain and the people were afraid to talk with him when they saw his face and so it, at the end of the chapter in verse 35 it says Moses put the veil upon his face until he went in to speak with him and the 
The people were afraid to come even near to him. And, uh, the, uh, and I suppose a parallel to this, um, there aren't many times in the Bible where we hear about someone's very countenance being changed, having met with God. But the only other account I could think of was that of Stephen, when in the New Testament, in the, in the book of Acts, he has been arrested for the great work for Christ that he has done. It says that he's full of faith and power. And they call him to in front of their authorities to find out why this man is, is turning Jerusalem upside down with the preaching of the gospel as he is doing. But before Stephen opens his mouth, it's really interesting what it says that and all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. That's Acts chapter 6 and verse 15. His face was, uh, was glorious. It didn't look like a man's face, but it was like a face of an angel. And we're not told much more about what that means, but, but I wonder if it... <clears throat> might not be something like that which happened to Moses. And that was before Stephen had opened his mouth with anything. And, and there were two things, I suppose, that God was wanting to make absolutely plain to them. And I'm so pleased that God not only tells us things, but he also illustrates things to us that we might know really be in no doubt by what, it, what he means. And wasn't it this first very simple thing that before Moses or before Stephen were to say anything, that the mark and the hand of God was visibly with them. It was saying that this is the one in whom uh, I have put my words and my authority. Hear him. That was just what happened, wasn't it, with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, where uh, it says that his clothes were transformed and became white uh, and brighter than the sun and then you remember what the father says when he he appears around him. he says this is my son hear ye him it was that same idea but not only christ's face but all of his clothes became like that that we might know you must hear what this man is going to say because he was speaking on behalf of god but there was a second sign that was also given or a second visible act that was that spoke volumes that was that not only did Moses's face shine but also it says in verse 13 uh, of Acts sorry of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and not as Moses which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished you know the second visible thing that happens was as well as Moses' face shining, he put a veil over his face so that all of the Israelites, when they were looking at Moses, couldn't really make out that shine, I suppose we might say, that was on his face. They, they could hear what he said, but they maybe couldn't quite see it. And it was only when Moses then talked with God back on the mountain that he took the veil off. And again, Scott was saying something very plain and simple for us to realize that Moses had something from God, but they were not permitted at that time to see it fully. They could not steadfastly look, it says in verse 13 of chapter three, uh, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. There was a, a, an ability for them only to see partially and to hear partially those things that Moses was giving them. And uh, the idea of a veil to stop us seeing something which we're not meant to see, I guess is quite familiar with us. And it used to be traditional, didn't it, that at weddings in this country, that the bride would wear a veil. And I suppose the indication was that the husband uh, to be the groom was not allowed to see his bride's face until they were married. And then the the person who is the minister who is marrying them would then lift the veil at that key point in the marriage ceremony because up at that up until that point the illustration was that the groom was not permitted to see his wife's face until they they were married 
Um, and in the Bible, there are a couple of times where that happens, isn't there, where Jacob thinks he's marrying Rachel, but actually his, his father-in-law has substituted Rachel for Leah. And how did he not realise? Well, it would have been because, I suppose, that they were wearing a veil, that she was wearing a veil in the wedding until that time. And uh, there's one other incident, the first time that Isaac saw his, or that Rebecca met Isaac um, when she had been wonderfully provided of God to be his wife. And when she, for the first time, sees him, not knowing who she is, but when she's told, that's, that's Isaac who you're going to marry, what did she do straight away? She took a veil and covered herself. And the point is that it was a way to stop people seeing that which they were not yet permitted to see. And this was the limitation, if I might put it, of the old covenant, that it had truth, didn't it, revealed from God. But as of yet, there was something that hadn't been dealt with, that meant that the eyes of man could not look upon it. We might say that, the, that we were in the, under the old covenant like Absalom, who had been brought back partly to Jerusalem, but couldn't yet look upon the face of God. And this was the, the limitation that was there. And the most, I suppose, strongest illustration of this was, of course, how the first tabernacle was, or the first temple that there were a series of veils, weren't there, into which only a few priests could go. And then the inner section where God uh, figuratively dwelt, only the high priest could go once a year through that veil. It, and it was to teach us something, just in the same way as Moses' face shining with the glory of God was to teach us. It was to show us that we did not yet have access to God. We were not yet reconciled there was a barrier that was there then and you see god is not why does god do this is it that he has was he mocking us could i put it that way that he was saying you can get part of the way back to me and you can see how close and how wonderful i am but you're not allowed to come that final distance was he playing with us in that respect holding forth the possibility of knowing him again but then drawing it back and saying, but it's impossible for you to draw near. No, it wasn't that at all, was it? It was showing that there was something more to come that hadn't yet been realised. And that was to be provided through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the law given by Moses was to show us that there's yet something that has to be dealt with. You're not yet right with God. You have the law of God. He has spoken to you but you're not yet able to enter into his presence. And we're dull of hearing, aren't we? We need these things to be crystal clear to ourselves. And so we have this illustration of the Moses' face shining and the veil to, that is still there to, uh, to this day if we are outside of Christ. And it's because of what is to follow. How is it then that we can know God? How is it that we, though we are fallen, how can we ever be restored rightly and fully to go to know God as freely as we knew him before the fall of man? Because that's what it is to be reconciled, isn't it? You know, that is the only form of true reconciliation to God that I might once again to be able to know him as if I had never sinned. That is, nothing else is short of that. Everything else other than that is just the old covenant, isn't it? Where we can come part the way, but not all the way. Should we be satisfied with that does god mock us when in verse 14 he says but with their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil so to this day that veil remains untaken away in the reading of the law which veil is done away in christ can i read that again in verse 14 which veil is done away in Christ. And I, I don't know about you when you sometimes read the Bible and you, and you read a phrase and think, I'm sure there's some, uh, some depth to this word in the in, in, in original language that I don't quite get. And, and this word actually means, uh, you could say, literally rendered entirely useless. 
There's no further use for it. It's been abolished or destroyed would be another way of saying it. Done away in Christ, rendered entirely useless. Absolutely taken away in Christ. No necessity for it any further. See, it was only Moses who could go up the mount on his own. No one else could go up there. No animal could even be at the foot of the mountain. There was a physical distance between the one man who could draw near to God and then the rest of the people of God. But he says in verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 3, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. Do you know how it, see it starts? We all, that is, all those who are in Christ, have that veil removed. And where it was only Moses who could then, now it is every person who is in Christ, that veil has been abolished. Do, do you wonder at that tonight, that idea that we're able now, one day we'll see him face to face, but now we are able with open face to behold the glory of the Lord. We are able, aren't we, to understand the gospel, to, to know God, and even, even more, we are changed in the same manner that Moses was changed. We all are changed by it from glory to glory. As we behold God, we are transformed ourselves. And he goes even more wonderfully at the end of verse 18, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And, we, and maybe that's an answer to how it was that Moses did shine in the way that he did. Maybe it was the Spirit of God that did that to him. Maybe not, but we know that that is the case with us, that we are all transformed into the same image by the Spirit of the Lord. That veil has been abolished, has been taken away, and now we might behold him. We might say thirdly, and I, I'm drawing to a close, how is it that this transformation takes? Do we all have to go up a high mountain and for there God to speak to us, do we need some form, if I might put it with a small s, of spiritual experience, whereby we might have to travel to some part of the world to be uh, uh, to receive some strange spiritual experience, would then fill us with the Spirit of God and transform us? No, that's not what he talks about here. That as we behold Him, that uh, uh, we are changed. Sorry, uh, we we have open face beholding are changed into the same image even as by the spirit of the lord how was moses changed was it not that as he heard from god that as he heard what god spoke as he met with god he was transformed as he did so and truthfully it is no difference for us is it about how we go about being changed isn't it as we meet with god as we read his word as we gather together as we pray to God, that we are changed by the Spirit of God. We don't come along to meetings and to the Word of God because we have an intellectual interest in those things, so that is good and right. But there's something more, isn't there? That as we do these things, as God gives us a Spirit of revelation, we see Him in these things, and the Spirit of God transforms us. It's just what Christ prayed in. John and chapter 17, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. That his words is the means that Christ prays. Let that work effectively in them. And that is the same means by which we are transformed into the image of God. We sang a beautiful hymn this morning. And uh, I regret I didn't have time to get us for a sing, to, to sing tonight. But it says, take, uh, it's 414 in the Redemption Hymn Law, if you have one of those at home. But it's a lovely, simple tune, but it goes, Take time to be holy. Speak oft with the Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his words. And then the second verse is, Take, spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus like him, thou shalt be. And isn't that a very simple answer about our sanctification and how we can go on? how we can grow in the glory 
in the in, in the knowledge um, and uh, growing grace and in the knowledge of God, as 2 Peter puts it, puts it. How did Moses grow? Wasn't it when he met with God that God himself transformed him? How is it that we can be transformed and go on from glory to glory? It will be through his truth, when it? Working as we spend much time in his presence that we will be transformed. It's, it's not because we do it to ourselves, but as we spend that time in the presence of God, he will transform us. And if I could go back to the way I began this section, that is, this is a promise to us all, isn't it? Not to the great believer, but excludes the least believer, but all the believers. This is the intention of God for us. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. Isn't it thrilling to think? how God has done away with the veil in Christ, that we might now know God in the manner in which Adam and Eve knew him before sin came to the world. Yes, he doesn't walk with us physically now as he did then, but as we open his word, do we not daily hear him speak to us? As we draw to him in prayer, do we not find that God has heard that which we've said, that we have actually met with him as we meet with the brethren and a brother or sister has a word of exhortation to not feel that that is as though God has spoken to us. He, he walks with us now. And the evidence is that we are also transformed by those things that we hear, that life from the presence of God throws down, throws, flows down to us. This is the glory of the new covenant. Who would wish to go back to the old covenant and think, well, there's something there that I need to go to to get nearer to God. There, there isn't. It's all in the scriptures, isn't it? But how far the new covenant through Christ exceeds the old. And this is the life whereby Christ has called us to. It's important, isn't it, for us to realise whom we are in Christ. Not to think of ourselves beyond that which we're able, but more to think about what Christ has provided for us. That we can ourselves be transformed into, into the image of God by his spirit as we behold him as in a glass until that day when we see him face to face. This is the glory of the new covenant. Well, let me finish by reading verse 18 again. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Well, just a, a, a bit unusual, but I wonder, um, for those particularly who might watch this subsequently, if we might just finish by singing a couple of verses of that song, we, of the hymn we sung before the scripture tonight, The Sands of Time Are Sinking, because it picks up of that idea that day spring is at hand and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Duck.